tell me when you are able to see it. We can see it now. Okay, and then I will set it up to slide presentation zoom. Okay, so what I thought I would do today is really focus on what is a clinical trial and how do patients get access to clinical trials. For those who, of us who work in academic practices at major cancer centers, what we try to do is offer patients opportunities for drugs that are on the market but used for other indications patients or to offer patients opportunities for new drugs that have yet come to market. And so I thought what I would do is just look at what is a clinical trial, how do you get involved in a clinical trial, and how do you find out if there are clinical trials for your type of sarcoma? And so clinical trials are very carefully designed medical research studies conducted um, to try to test promising diagnostic treatment and prevention methods. And what they're all trying to do is answer a very specific question. There are sponsors of clinical trials. The sponsors of the clinical trials traditionally are the ones who pay for the clinical trials that come with a large cost to run. There's an administrative cost, there's a cost of treatments, a cost of the testing, and then a cost of the drugs as well. And so one could do a clinical trial that is sponsored or supported by a pharmaceutical company, and that would be an investigational new drug. The academic medical centers could petition fundings from drug companies and, um, and other um, organizations in order to run clinical trials, and that would be deemed an investigator-initiated trial. So the investigator works at the medical center, and the medical center is the one who's paying for the clinical trial with grant support and supports from other um, organizations. And then lastly, there is the National Cancer Institute that supports a lot of these groups that get many academic centers together, many community practices together so that people run clinical trials together. So for the most part, most of the clinical trials that are run for our cancer patients and the sarcoma patients in particular are going to be interventional studies. So these are going to be treatment. And so treatment is going to be drugs with an aim at improving the outcomes of the patients and making the patients live longer. There are some prevention trials. So for patients that are cancer-free but have had a prior diagnosis, we can do some trials to prevent the cancer from coming back. And then a lot of the trials will also factor in some quality of life. Um, and there will also be issues with respect to, you could be doing some screening protocols and trials to try to prevent other cancers if you're looking for that. So why are clinical trials important? So for any cancer patient who's ever been on a therapy, the therapy that they're on, the only reason they're on that therapy is because other people have been involved in these clinical trials. And so it is thanks to the patients ahead of us that have participated in clinical trials that we have a better understanding about the disease and a better understanding how to treat these. And so really to advance the standard of care for cancer treatments, we have to do clinical trials. So if we want to do better than where we are today, we have to do the trials to figure out what is the best mechanism. It also gives us an understanding of the disease process. Built into clinical trials could be other factors whereby we collect information and that information helps us better understand sarcomas as a whole. Um, we also require clinical trials because otherwise the FDA will not approve a drug for clinical practice and therefore any of the drugs that we all are prescribing today and taking for our cancer, we wouldn't have access to them. So the first randomized trial, so that's where patients get put into two different categories, um, was done in 1948, and this was looking at patients with pulmonary tuberculosis, and they were randomized to receive streptomycin, which is an antibiotic, versus placebo. The reason we randomize trials, and by randomization, often what happens is computers will arbitrarily put people into different baskets of treatment. We do that to eliminate any biases. And so if I was putting someone in a clinical trial, I can't choose my favorite patient or I can't choose all of my patients that they'll have a better outcome. And then I think my other colleagues at other centers will choose patients differently. Essentially to do a clinical trial where we don't understand or don't understand what the outcome will truly be, we anticipate the outcomes will be beneficial. But if we really wanna do these to see what's gonna happen, we have to eliminate bias from the people that are enrolling patients into the trials. 
And so the randomization happens because we want to see, we don't want to have a say in which treatment the patient will get. They're often called double blind. And so what happens is the treating physician as well as the patient is unaware of what treatment they're getting. Um, and this is typical for very late stage studies and for studies that are going to then finish and go to the FDA for approval. So if we look at what was affecting our populations over time and we look at 1900 versus 2010, we see there are certainly changes to what essentially is affecting us. And so early on, it was a lot of the infections, heart disease, cancer was much lower. As we've had a better understanding of being able to diagnose cancer, we see that it's going up. And there really is this, this real presence and this pressure to get a better handle on our cancer diagnosis and treatments for these patients. So what have we learned over time? Well, we certainly learned that we have issues pertaining to understanding cancers, and that certainly has evolved with the discovery of the Human Genome Pro Project in 2002. Um, we know that emerging therapies um, are often more targeted, and so they have fewer side effects, better tolerated for the patients. And then we've also seen over time that race, gender, ethnicity, while it could also be a risk factor, it also could have an inherent bias, and we need to equalize how we treat our patients so that all patients, irrespective of race, gender, and ethnicity, come to the table equally and therefore have equal outcomes and hopefully improved outcomes for those that have been at a disadvantage until now. So there are definitely many stages of development um, in medicine and in oncology and in treatment of our sarcoma patients. There is laboratory-based research where we're trying to figure out what we think will help the patients. We then test these in animals, and then we move them into clinical trials in humans. And so we have phase one clinical trials, phase two, phase three, and there are some phase four clinical trials. Most of us in large academic centers and cancer centers do not participate in phase four trials, and I'll sort of um, talk to you a little bit about what those are. So phase one clinical trials are the first studies in people to test the safety of the drug. We put the patients in these trials based on the effect of the drug, how we think it will work, as well as based on the diagnosis of the patient, hoping to match a good diagnosis with a good drug so that the outcomes becomes favorable for the patient. But in essence, the studies are really looking at safety of the drugs. Once we establish that the drug is safe, we move it into a phase two clinical trial, and that's looking to see, is the drug effective? And so that's when we start to hone in on certain populations. And so let's say we were just going to do a study on leiomyosarcoma. Well, then we would get all the leiomyosarcoma patients into this phase two trial. In the phase three, we compare the investigational drug with what is considered standard of care if we have a standard of care. And so often we do it against other drugs. Sometimes we do it against placebos. You can't do it against a placebo if there is a standard of care treatment to be offered because that would not be ethical. And then stage four comes after a drug has already been FDA approved. Often the company wants to get real world data and see what happens to people. And so they go to community practices and they try to collect data on patients to see what's happening with them on these drugs. So the way it works here at a academic center or a cancer center is that the protocol gets submitted to the center. It has a review at what is considered a disease team meeting. So all the sarcoma people get together and discuss the protocol. Would this be applicable for our patient population? Is it doing the right thing? And then it goes through two committees that carefully look at the protocol from a scientific standpoint and an ethical standpoint. And that's the scientific review committee and then an institutional review board, which is the ethics committee. And then afterwards, you could get the trial initiated and then you start with enrollment. So how successful are our trials? And so when we look at our clinical trials in different clinical phases, and we see what percent of trials will come to market eventually, right across the board in all diseases that we treat, about 11% of drugs that are tested in clinical practice come to um, fruition and are approved by the FDA. In oncology back in 2004, the number was 6%. It has improved a little bit over the years, but everything we try is not a slam dunk, obviously, and therefore we have to continue to hone in our skills at trying to perfect the right drug for the right patient. 
So there are a lot of myths around clinical trial. And one of the biggest myths that people walk in when I try to present a clinical trial, the first question that gets asked is about placebos. And so the real myth is I might receive a placebo instead of an active treatment. So the fact is placebos are rarely used in cancer clinical trial, and it's only used if there is no established standard of care. And you cannot receive a placebo as part of a clinical trial unless you are informed that there is a placebo as part of the trial. So if you are told you are getting active drug, you are getting active drug. If you are told that you are being randomized and part of the randomization is to placebo versus drug, then yes, you may end up with a placebo. If you're being randomized, they will tell you your percent chance of getting the placebo. Sometimes it's 50%, sometimes it's 33% but you will definitely be told what your likelihood is. But for the most part, it is very unusual that patients will be randomized to placebo on cancer clinical trials. Currently, if we look at our portfolio of all our sarcoma trials that are ongoing, none of them involve placebos at this point. The second myth I often see from people is they don't think clinical trials are safe. And so what becomes very important is to know that each step in drug development is highly regulated to ensure the safety and protection of the research participants, and that all of the cancer treatments we have today and every drug that we prescribe for a patient is based on a clinical trial. And so we would have nothing if we didn't do these trials properly, and we would have nothing if we didn't have patients participating in them. The other myth is often about choice and about rights. And so a question that I often get is, if I consent to a clinical trial, will I lose the chance to receive more effective standard treatments? And so standard treatments are always available to patients. Patients may withdraw participation in a clinical trial at any time for any reason. So if you sign on to a clinical trial, it does not prevent you from doing other things. You could do anything you want at any time. Everything is about the patient. So we work in a very patient-focused system, and the patient-focused system takes into account what the patient's rights and desires are, and we would always uphold for that. And then also people feel if you present them a clinical trial, that means that there is nothing else available. And often you hear the term, no hope. Why would you present a clinical trial if I had hope of something else? And so clinical trials are often available for all stages of cancer including newly diagnosed and untreated patients. So right across the board, you may be presented with a clinical trial if there is one available, because often what we're trying to do is perfect where we are and get things to be better. And so we are doing trials at different elements and different stages. And so most of the trials are not for patients who have exhausted all other therapies. Most of our trials in sarcomas are for patients that have a tremendous amount of opportunities, but we try to do the trials early on to give them better outcomes. So the question is, how do you enter a clinical trial? And so there are eligibility criteria. You do go through an informed consent process. So it's an opportunity to learn about the potential of a trial. You learn about the benefits and side effects of the trial. It is not a contract. Even though it is about 30 plus pages, it is not a contract. Um, it really allows for an open dialogue between the patient, the clinician, as well as a clinical team. As part of a clinical trial, you will be introduced to nurses, research coordinators, data managers. So your team just becomes a lot larger. The potential benefits of being part of a clinical trial is really to gain access to an advanced treatment. Um, you're looking also to extend treatment options. And so if we have seven or eight lines of different therapies for an average patient, this then gives you 10, 12 different treatment options. So really to try to find the one that will work for you. The study treatment often comes at no cost. Um, that's, that's a benefit, but it's not a reason to do the study in my opinion, um, but the study treatment does come at no cost. Um, the cost that you do have on clinical trials is the cost of the care involved in the trial because all of that is standard of care, but the drug itself is given to you free of charge. Um, you also have a potential benefit to helping the community as a whole, helping patients down the line from you, helping um, sarcoma patients right across the board or other cancer patients by contributing to the advancement of medicine. The potential risks is that really uh, there are potentials for unknown side effects of the study treatment. The study may require additional time than standard therapies. And so you may have extra visits, extra blood draws, extra time in the clinic. Um, and then if the study treatment is ineffective, then you've taken some of these added risks without the benefit. 
So the question often comes from patients, who's watching out for me? And so often they feel that there is an incentive for the physician to enroll a patient into a clinical trial. And while the incentive is to improve the field, the incentive is to get more information about the disease, the incentive is to make things better for patients. Um, there are people that are overseeing all of this to make sure that we're doing things in a fair and ethical way. And that includes the FDA, the NCI, the institutional review boards are separate, and so they are overseeing it. And then I really feel very strongly. Yeah. That, I really feel strongly that the physician or the investigator is clearly watching out for your best interest, um, and yeah. one should really believe that that is happening. So I think the questions you need to ask your physicians when you're coming in and thinking about clinical trials is: What are your other options? Who put the study together? So it's very important to know who's sponsoring the study. Um, where else is the trial being conducted? And so if you're traveling very far to get on a study only to find out that it could be done half an hour away from you, well then yes, it makes more sense to do it closer to home. Um, what will I get out of the study? So really, what are your expectations from this? What are the risks involved? How long does it last for? And what testing is involved in the study? Just so that you're aware of everything that may be involved before you sign up. And then you would need to ask your doctor to help you out in this. You need to research what academic medical centers are in your area and then go online. And I'm gonna show you how to get through clinicaltrials.gov. And so if we're looking to find a sarcoma clinical trial and I put what we would find if you were looking in our area at City of Hope. And so essentially you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you type in the condition of sarcoma. I put no other terms. I Try to filter it for the United States. It's very hard to do clinical trials if you're American outside the United States just because of the legal aspects of it. Um, I added the state, I added the city. Um, and then what we found is that there were 92 studies for sarcoma patients currently at City of Hope. I then I start. Oh, sorry, Dr. Avalnik, I got yes. a question. I'm wondering if I could ask it right now. Um, of course. Someone, someone messaged me and asked, they're not being treated at a research hospital. So how might they get involved in clinical trials if their treating hospital doesn't have any available trials? Yeah, so that's a great yeah, question. And that really happens to a lot of patients. And so what we find is a lot of patients move in and out of the different systems. And so they get treated in one center. And if the center doesn't have the capability to do a trial, they get referred to another one for the trial. They stay at that center for as long as the trial is ongoing. And then they get transferred back at their requests or if they want to back to their treating physicians once the trial is over. And so within our patient population, we do refer our patients to other academic centers in the area based on what is available. We try not to duplicate work. And so every center is not gonna have the same trials. And so tomorrow you may have a trial available at City of Hope. And then in six months, if that trial wasn't working, you may have something at UCLA or vice versa. And so really to find a trial, what you would do is you would ask your treating physician to contact someone at the center you're looking to see if there's a trial at, or you would go on clinicaltrials.gov and try to find something. And then anytime you go on this site, it will give you an email address or a phone number to call. And that person could then tell you whether or not you are eligible for the trial. Often they could just review your chart and then quickly tell you, is this a trial for you? Yes or no. And so we field a lot of emails and a lot of phone calls every day, seeing for patients who are asking if they're eligible for certain clinical trials. Um, but an easy way to do it is just have your doctor reach out to a physician at a center that you're interested in going to. So if you're interested in coming here, just have your doctor reach out to myself if you have a sarcoma, and then I could quickly go through and look to see whether or not you're eligible for a trial. Most of us understand our portfolio of trials very well, and so most of us will know what's open and what's available, and so we, it's unlikely to bring someone in to be told that there is no trial available. We try to prevent doing that. So as part of this clinicaltrials.gov website, you would look at the area. And then I just put in some filters. And so I ticked off um, that the study is recruiting patients because I think it's important to see what studies are recruiting versus which ones are completed already. I did it for any age for both males and females. And then at the bottom of my screen, I added for interventional clinical trials. And so that weeded me down from a start of 92 
down to 23. And so 23 is much more manageable to look for. And then just as an example, it will give you the name of the trial, it will give you the drug being used, it will give you the site. And so if you take number one, we are testing a new drug from a company called Bayer. The drug is called Rogaratinib. Um, and we are currently testing it for patients with gastrointestinal stromal tumors, um, as well as patients with sarcomas that have an FGFR receptor alteration. And that would be found on a report of the pathology. The second study is currently being done for leiomyosarcomas, as well as other types of sarcomas. And that's using a combination of cabozantinib, which is an oral drug with temozolomide, which is an oral chemotherapy. And then in the listing on the side, it says other. So there are also quality of life assessments and questionnaires as part of that study. And so that is something else that's built into these studies is trying to figure out how patients do. And then the last one I had pulled up here is tezemenostat, which is a drug being explored for epithelioid sarcomas. And so it is a temenostat with doxorubicin, um, but it also is an arm of the study is using a placebo with doxorubicin. So everybody gets the standard of care chemotherapy. Half the patients get this added drug, half the patients get placebo, but everybody gets an active drug. And it's sort of on the right-hand side, we'll show you where else this is being done. If you're looking for studies at City of Hope, this is a website at City of Hope. And our care team for sarcoma is very happy to assist, um, help you navigate through this, whether or not we have something for you or whether or not we could send you somewhere else. We certainly want to make sure that we're able to partner all sarcoma patients with the right therapy for them. And so we're also able to see you from a surgical perspective, review pathology or any other needs you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agelnick. Are we handing it over to you, Dr. Zuckerman? Yeah, let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, is it showing up there? It is. Okay. So um, thank you all for having me today. Um, I'm Dr. Lee Zuckerman. I'm an orthopedic oncologist, and I'm going to talk to you mostly about bone and sarcoma and, and what we do as orthopedic oncology in general, um, with a sp particular focus on joint sparing and limb lengthening surgery. So this is a little more of new technology, new techniques that we have in orthopedic oncology. Um, so first of all, just a background of what I do as an orthopedic oncologist, because we're we're a pretty rare subspecialty. There's only typically between two and 300 in the United States at any given time. Um, but we do treat both benign and cancerous tumors that involve the arms, the legs, or the pelvis. And this is for both bone and the soft tissue. Now, sarcomas are primary tumors that arise from the bone, muscle, fat, those types of tissues. They're not from organs such as the lung, breast, prostate. So uh, orthopedic oncology specializes in sarcoma, but we do treat all types of cancer depending on what, what needs to be taken care of. So when or why would you see an orthopedic oncologist? First, if there's any new lesion in your bone, and even if you have a previous diagnosis of cancer and a different type of cancer. So if you have breast cancer, but it wasn't invasive, it was treated extremely well, and it's maybe six, seven years uh, away from your, your uh, treatment for that, and suddenly there's a new spot that shows up in the bone, that may not be due to the breast cancer. So it's important to see somebody because if this were to be a sarcoma or something else, it's extremely important to have that taken care of um, by someone who specializes in sarcoma. The other thing that we, we see frequently is if someone has cancer that they know is in the bone and they've started having more pain. And we assess people for uh, whether or not the bone might break, their fracture risk, as well as um, there are some side effects for treatments of different types of cancers that may cause some orthopedic problems, such as long-term steroids, particularly high dose, and then bisphosphonates, um, which are used in many types of cancers now, as well as osteoporosis. And there can be problems with stress fractures and other issues that, that we would be uh, looking out for. Um, 
Why is it important to see an orthopedic oncologist? Why does it make a difference? Particularly sarcoma, that's extremely important. And if you aren't specialized in orthopedic oncology, a regular orthopedic surgeon is not gonna treat a sarcoma. And the, the trouble that people get into is whether or not they see an orthopedic oncologist first or if they're treated by an outside orthopedic surgeon um, because sometimes the treatment isn't done properly and that's the biggest problem we get into. Also different types of cancer re require different treatments. Um, some types of cancers respond to radiation or systemic therapy and you may not need surgery or it should be done in combination with those types of things. And certain types of cancers have an improved prognosis with uh, removing them, such as kidney cancer, renal cell carcinoma. If you're able to take the cancer completely out of the bone, basically taking it out like you would a sarcoma, then people have um, a better prognosis overall. You're also more likely to have coordinated care and have sarcoma specialists taking care of you or just specialists in the field of cancer um, for the cancer that you have. And that's because there aren't very many of us. So most orthopedic oncologists are situated and affiliated with a major cancer center or a research hospital. And basically what it comes down to is that cancer is what we take care of. And so we're able to uh, treat you well from the beginning to the end of your treatment um, and make sure that there's no issues with it. And that comes back to the, the biggest problem that we have in terms of orthopedic oncology is that the most common reason to need an amputation, particularly if the diagnosis is a sarcoma, is because someone had a biopsy that wasn't properly done or had a surgery that wasn't done in the context of a sarcoma. So limb salvage surgery, basically any surgery that we're operating on for cancer, we, we call it limb salvage surgery. We're trying to save people's arms and legs from, from cancer. Uh, the rates of being able to do that are now very high, um, and that can be as high as 90 to 95 percent, even with sarcomas. Traditionally, the complication rate can be high, and sometimes it's not better to have limb salvage surgery, um, but we can still do it in the majority of the cases, and it can still be extremely successful. And as time has gone by, we've got improved techniques, we've got improved implants, and the rate of performing limb salvage surgery is so high that it's, it's not just a focus now on trying to just save someone's arms or legs. We're trying to do things that are going to give the person the best function possible. Now, the most important thing in terms of cancer surgery is number one, take care of the cancer. Number two, take care of the cancer. Number three, take care of the cancer. But after that, if we can save someone's arms or legs, the goal is to give them the best function possible. And so with that, I'm going to mostly focus on joint sparing surgery, where we can save someone's hip, knee, shoulder, elbow joint. Um, because if you can save the person's joint, they're more likely to have a long-term outcome that's better, less complications, less wearing out of the implants that we use. There's also some problems when we try to save people's arms and legs where one leg may be longer than another, or they may develop a deformity, and we have ways of addressing that now. So this is just some pictures, and I'm going to show lots of pictures, so if I don't explain anything well enough, uh, let me know. Um, but on the left here, what we have is the shin bone, the tibia, and a cancer was taken out of this part of the shin bone and it's been replaced with a metal replacement. And this has a portion that goes inside the marrow of the bone at the top of the bottom and is fixed with some bone cement. And overall, these can work very well. The problem is they aren't fixed to the bone always so well enough that they won't loosen or wear out of time, over time. So this can have problems over time. This is the case of where a femur, a thigh bone, had cancer in it and the entire femur had to come out. This was in a child, so this is actually a femur that's able to uh, grow as the child grows. Um, the biggest problem, especially when people are younger, if you're replacing their joints, is these implants wear out. And if they wear out, that means you need further surgery, which can have more complications and higher risks. And, Usually the function is not as good if you've had more than one surgery for it. 
Here we have a case where the cancer was in this area here and they've used donated bone. And we've got a plate with some screws holding the spot as well as a rod. And we can see down here, it's a little hard to see, but the bone looks pretty well incorporated down here. Here we still see a line where the bone uh, is meeting the donated bone here. And that's typically what happens with traditional fixation is, is what I tell people, it's usually about 50-50. It's not quite that, but usually one side will heal really well, the other side won't. And it usually will take more than one surgery or a really long period of time for this part to heal. Um, and the last one here, this typically is not used for surgery. This is what's called an external fixator. So if you've ever seen someone with a contraption on their leg with some pins that are going into the, the skin, this is used when people have uh, legs or arms that are shorter than uh, the other side to try and lengthen them as well as if they have a deformity. And again, it's not typically used in cancer surgery because the risk of getting an infection with a pin outside coming outside your skin, if you're on chemotherapy, you're immunosuppressed is high. So the risk of using this if you're on active cancer treatment um, is high enough that we don't typically use this. So just an example to start off of something that we do for metastatic disease, this is not sarcoma, particularly, but this is just to highlight the difference of, of how, as an orthopedic oncologist, I would treat something versus um, if I just went through a standard orthopedic residency and didn't specialize in orthopedic oncology. So on the left here, this is uh, the hip joint up here with the ball in the socket. And we can see there's this dark spot here. This is where the cancer is in the bone and it's broken out through the bone. So we don't see the the nice thick white part here that would be the outer part of the bone. This is something that started in the marrow and broke out into the bone here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take out that tumor um, and we're gonna fix the bone with a rod. The rod goes all the way from the hip area down to the knee area. And the purpose of that is to fix the whole bone. So worst case, let's say someone developed another tumor over here, the bone is already fixed and we don't have to do a second surgery for that. And then we're gonna fill this spot with bone cement, basically like filling a cavity in a tooth. And so that fixes the bone. The studies show that this has less pain, less risk of this rod breaking. We don't have to worry about this bone healing. Patient can go on and get some radiation or other things that kill bone and kill the cancer, but also prevent the bone from healing. And it gets treated and we we have less risk of it coming back, less risk of the hardware failing. In this picture, what we see on the left here is a patient who was treated uh, by an uh, orthopedic surgeon where they had a similar spot in their bone down here originally, but they just had the rod placed through. And this is similar to what would happen with a sarcoma if someone put the rod through it, because this, the sarcoma may not respond well to radiation or other treatments, and it hasn't been taken out. So now what we've got is someone who's got a rod that's barely holding the hip together, and this is all now uh, cancer that's grown from that one spot. This is renal cell carcinoma, and so it typically doesn't respond well to radiation, and it doesn't always respond as well in the bone to some of the systemic treatments that we have. A lot of the other spots respond really well, but the bone doesn't always respond really well. So this goes from having, you know, where we were able to save the hip joint to where now we have to take out the entire area and do a, a, a more major hip replacement for the patient. So what can we do, you know, in extreme circumstances where traditionally we would have to take out the person's joint to do one of these large replacements. What technology, what techniques can we have now that can help with this? So this is a patient um, who had an osteosarcoma uh, that arose from their tibia. And this is the front view. So the shin bone here, the tibia with the knee joint up top here, the ankle is down at the bottom. And basically the tumor is coming along here. So all this new bone that's formed, that's, that's part of the cancer and it's bridging over to the fibula, the small bone. This is a side view of the bone and you can see it's coming from the back of the bone here. So what we can do is the patient can get a CAT scan and we can do a 3D printed model of it at this point. 
So here again is the x-ray. This is the 3D printed model. The red portion here is uh, where the tumor is. So we can see the tumor is pretty extensive. It involves a, a big portion of the, the back of the, the shin bone here. And if we look at the back here, you know, it's coming from the back, but it, it actually spares a lot of the bone that's on the front. So from that, we can create models where it would recreate what we're doing to cut out the bone and have custom cutting jigs. So special jigs that are 3D printed that are now used to cut the bone so you can take out the tumor while saving as much bone as possible. So again, this is the back view of the, the shin bone, the tibia. We're saving just a little bit up at the top here where the joint is, saving a little bit of the front and then the rest of the bone down here. And this is the part that we're taking out. Then we can reconstruct this with donated bone and we can use the same jig, basically just the opposite, to then cut the donated bone to fit into this spot. So what that looks like in this patient, uh, again, this is the front view and we can sort of see uh, the bone here that doesn't quite uh, look like their normal bone from here to here. We got a plate and screws holding everything together. And on the side view, you can see it a little bit better so this is where the donated bone is coming down. And again, we were able to save just, just enough at the joint up there, save just enough of the front of the bone here and fixed up to the top and the bottom. And as I mentioned with these donated uh, bone reconstructions is that typically one side will heal better than the other. And that was the case with this patient. So you can see here, there's just these two plates here and now uh, a while later, we've got more plates, bigger plates down at the bottom here. And that's because the top part healed well. We can see this is blending together, um, but the bottom part had some problems. So it did take a second surgery to uh, uh, get this portion to heal. The problem with plates is also that the bone typically doesn't integrate your own bone into it completely. It's only usually a couple of millimeters. So this is the person's normal bone here, and it's probably growing into about here. So the part along the side here and the back is probably still dead bone. Um, and the problem with that is that you just don't get enough um, ingrowth of that bone, enough vascularity. So if there's a way to do that, then we'd like to do that as well. The way these bones typically heal is by compression. So basically squishing the two bones together so that your body can recognize that the donated bone is supposed to be part of your own bone. Plates get a good amount of compression, but so then we look to, well, is there another way to do that? And there is a new implant that's out um, that's typically been used for making people taller cosmetically or for people who were born with one leg or arm shorter than the other. And what this is, it's a rod that goes inside the bone and has a magnet inside it that powers a motor. And the rod can telescope. So the portion of the rod here can get longer or shorter, um, depending on which way the magnet is powered. And it has this external remote control that has a magnet in it. And what the person does is they put that on their arm or leg, uh, usually for just a couple minutes a day, but usually two or three times a day. And what this does is it powers the motor and it takes where the bone is cut with this telescoping, the, the rod is fixed up top and at bottom here. And as this telescopes out, it lengthens the bone. And this goes about a millimeter a day at most. So people don't feel it, it doesn't hurt. Um, but what it does do is it tricks the body to thinking it has a broken bone. And what the body then does is it treats this like it's a broken bone and it starts forming new bone there because that's what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to heal the bone. So as long as you're going at a slow enough rate, the body is tricked into to basically healing its own bone and we can lengthen bones. There's a similar implant where we can transport the bones. So in this case, similar thing, a rod that's powered by a magnet with a motor um, but we have a, a screw that goes here along a track. And this track goes basically along here. So if we take out a tumor and we've got a spot here that we got to fill in, instead of using the donated bone, 
um, what we can do is take the normal bone and transport it down into that defect. And so we're gonna basically move this bone down here and then it's gonna heal to the bottom part here. And the top part again is going to be tricked into believing that it's broken and form new bone. So this is one way that we can utilize what the body does normally to reconstruct the bone as opposed to putting metal or donated bone in there. So let's look at a couple of, of instances of that. So this is a patient that had a, a cancer in the, the arm bone, the humerus here, shoulder joint is up here. So we're gonna have to take out from about here to here. And again, we could use the metal replacement, but with this amount of bone left, it's gonna be a little hard if you only have from here to here to get that to be fixed well. Um, we could do a big shoulder replacement as well, but again, those functionally don't do well. So in this case, we're gonna take it out and we're gonna use the donated bone. So we put the donated bone with the rod inside it here. This is the telescoping part here. And in this case, we're not trying to lengthen anything. We're basically using this to, to squeeze the bone together, to compress it as much as possible. And we've done studies on this that shows that we can get more compression with this rod than we typically would with a plate. So hopefully that's gonna help things to heal better. And what we can see over time, these sharp edges of the donated bone up top here, we got good integration of it there. Down at the bottom, it's basically got early signs of healing. And then after another couple of months, we see that there's remodeling of the bone here. And this is really well incorporated into the patient's own bone. This part of the bone probably still doesn't have a good blood supply, but we definitely have some uh, good ingrowth of the bone, both top and bottom. And we're not doing more than one surgery, ideally, to get this to happen. This is not perfect. It can still take more than one surgery, but we see that the rates of healing with this type of of implant um, overall are on the higher range of healing for when we try to get the donated bone to heal. So let's look at trying to combine a couple things now. And this is a child. Um, the bone here is still growing. That's what these lines here. So this is the knee joint in this area and this is the growth plate. So this is where the bones are growing. And we can see that the bone has been eaten up by the cancer here. If we look at an MRI, which is still looking from the front to the back, so this is the hip joint up here. This is where the cancer starts here and goes down to about here. So we're gonna have to cut the bone about here and up here. And again, there's not much left if we were trying to do a replacement. So we'd probably have to at least replace the person's knee joint, if not their hip joint. Um, so again, the option in this case would be to do donated bone versus something else if we want to try to save their, their hip and knee joint. So in this case, again, take out the tumor, put in the donated bone, which is starting up here and going all the way down to here. Uh, with the rod again, starting up at the hip area and going down, this is the telescoping part and we're again squishing the bone together. And now what we're seeing over time is this is healing again really well. So this is where the juncture of the bone, the patient's own bone and the donated bone, and we can see it looks much more normal. You know, it's much harder to tell, even on the side view, that this is now donated bone. And down at the bottom, you know, I know it's here, but again, it's very hard to distinguish the two. Um, now, in this case, I did take out these screws because this rod you know, went past where the person was growing. But because of all the compression, I did end up stopping the bone from growing, which is okay because we have a rod in there that now we can use to lengthen the person's bone. So a couple of years passed and uh, they had a growth spurt, grew about three inches. So now they could wear, you know, a custom shoe or things like that. Or what we can do now is use the same implant, cut the bone just around where the rod is here on both the front and side view, and then go through the lengthening process. And as we go through that lengthening process, we see the new bone that's forming here. And at the end of it, 
what we can see is all this new bone that's formed, it's become even harder to tell where the donated bone starts and stops. It's somewhere in this region. Um, very good incorporation of the donated bone here. And you can see this is how much that rod has now telescoped. So this gets the person's legs to be equal. They don't have to walk with a shoe lift. Um, we've saved their hip and knee joints. So overall, we're giving the person better function and uh, better long-term uh, results. What I wanna stress also with this is that what we're seeing with doing this technique is that we're seeing a lot better integration of the donated bone. So here again is a person who had cancer taken out of here, a sarcoma taken out, and this is the donated bone down here. And after just a couple months, we see all this new bone that's bridging. We still see the line here, which we don't like, but then after another couple of months, this is extremely well integrated. And instead of that couple of millimeters that we were typically seeing with plates or traditional fixation, we're seeing new bone that's going down several centimeters. So overall, this, this uh, has some advantages um, to traditional techniques. So what about someone who just has one leg longer or shorter than the other? Obviously now we can take care of that. So this is someone who had a sarcoma in their pelvis. Um, this is the top of the femur, the thigh bone, and it was fused to the pelvic bone. Um, they didn't have very good motion. You can see between these two, that's bringing their leg out. So the legs were actually crossing over one of the, of the other most of the time. And they had actually uh, broken through part of their pelvic bone and basically formed a joint there to get that much motion. Um, you can see here because the hip bone has gone all the way up here because there's no pelvic bone in that area, you know, the right leg here, this is the right side, the left side, the right leg is definitely shorter than the opposite side. So what we do is we realign the bone up at the top so that we don't have their legs crossing over anymore. And then we put in one of these rods, cut the bone here. It's going to telescope from here. We see the telescoping and we see all that new bone that's formed. Uh, many times we try to take out these rods. We don't always, but because it has a magnet in there, if someone needs an MRI, um, that can cause some problems uh, with being able to see things in that area. So we take that out and we can see that basically this is all no bone that's formed. It's the patient's own bone. And the difference on these x-rays that look at the uh, limb length, so you can see the right side here that we did the surgery on, big difference in where the knee is. So that's basically the, they're standing on an area here where they're gonna have to have a very large shoe lift. Once you get uh, the bone the same length, now the knee heights are the same area. They don't have to wear a custom shoe. Um, when they're not wearing a custom shoe at home, they aren't limping as much, which can hurt the back or the other leg and things like that. And this can be for other things. So a patient here who had a sarcoma that was removed and had to have multiple surgeries to, to save their hip. This was done about five to 10 years before they saw me. This leg had to be shortened multiple times in order to, to be able to save it. Um, and what we can see here is the difference. It's about five inches from about here down to here. Now we can't do anything with the femur here, the thigh bone, because there isn't much bone left unless we were to use the, the external fixator. So we're gonna do something instead with the, the tibia, the shin bone. And it's a similar process, basically putting the rod in. We have to cut both bones in this case, but again, can lengthen this and we got that new bone that's forming just like the body thinks it's a broken bone. The other problem that uh, patients can get is, especially pediatric patients, is sometimes when we operate on a bone, it either stops growing or grows quicker. And in this case, this was a young patient with a sarcoma who had this taken out, had the allograft reconstruction with a plate in this case. Um, this part again healed extremely well. We still see the bone down here. So again, it's sort of that 50-50. But what you can see has happened, it's a little hard to see down here, but this is the growth plate. This is where the bone is growing and it's a nice horizontal line here. Now it's, it's curved a bit and that's because uh, basically due to a surgery and everything like that, 
one side is growing quicker over here than this side. So that's giving them basically a knock knee. The other thing that's happening is that the bone is extending. So this should be straight out going this way, but it's extended this way. So they've got a deformity as well as one leg is now longer than the other one. So at that point, we can take out that plate, put in one of these rods, realign the bone, cut the bone, and then lengthen them. And you can see the difference on the left versus the right here. This is before the surgery. The person is knock kneed. The leg is shorter than the other one. We straightened that out. This is during the lengthening process. So now the leg is straight. We're able to get the legs the same length. And then we see a very well healed bone here and even better incorporation of the bone, the donated bone here. So overall, we can correct these problems. Last couple things I'm gonna mention are more bone transport. So let's say we don't want to, or for whatever reason, it's not a good idea to use the donated bone. Some people are not comfortable with having a donated bone um, for multiple different reasons. And in that case, there's the option of using the person's own bone to reconstruct it. So this is a, a patient again, a cancer in the arm bone, the humerus here. So we're gonna take it out this is a small enough area that we can actually shorten the bone. And so we bring the two bones together and that is technically one way to treat it. Now people can live with one arm shorter than the other. The problem that you get is the muscles aren't typically as strong, they lose some strength and things like that. So ideally if we can, we get the length back to where it should be. So in this case, we brought it together with the rod here, not telescoped at this point, and we're gonna slowly lengthen the bone. And again, we see the telescoping here. We see the bone starting to form. And then once we get the arms about the same length, we let the bone heal in. And now the person has their own bone throughout this area. And it's the same length as the opposite side. So what about using that other nail that I had mentioned, the bone transport nail, where we got it working on a track. So that is a, is a newer option that uh, can work again instead of using the donated bone. So we've got a patient with cancer in their femur, their thigh bone again, hip joint is up here, knee joint is down here. And we can see it's a pretty big tumor um, that involves a good amount of the femur. So we're gonna take that out. So this is the portion that we took out here down towards the bottom. We put this rod in, we have to cut the bone up top here to where we're transporting it. And then this is that screw that's running on that track when they activate the magnet. So uh, the person uses the magnet. We can see that the bones move down here. This is all the new bone that's formed and it's just a lot of new bone and we just continue going on down until we get to the point where these bones meet together and get it to heal. This can be, you can see how robust this bone is. So this is a, a lot of new bone that's formed there. And over time, this is gonna remodel it's gonna look like the person's normal bone. It basically is the person's normal bone. Their own bone has a normal blood supply, it works as the normal bone and uh, less risk of infection, less risk of a lot of problems that we get when we use other ways to treat this. And we bring this down and get that to heal. And this can be done in, in pretty extreme circumstances. So this is just another example, a younger patient with an osteosarcoma that was down here at their distal distal, the bottom part of the femur at the knee joint area. So we're able to just save a little bit. We have to take out where the bone, right where the growth plate is. It goes all the way up to that spot. So we're saving just enough of the joint there. Um, this is showing where the tumor was taken out. This little bit is what's left down at the joint. We, again, we cut the bone here, transport it down, move it down until we meet and it heals down here. And then this part is gonna fill in with bone over time. So basically the, the thing with orthopedic oncology is, you know, traditionally what we used to say or what I used to say is that we had a lot of bad solutions to bad problems, but as techniques and technology have continued to improve, um, we're not just performing limb salvage surgery, that's being expanded to joint pres preser preservation surgery. We're able to correct problems that we get from limb salvage surgery with limb length discrepancies and deformities. 
And basically we're able to put a little more emphasis on not just saving someone's arms or legs, we're able to put more emphasis on regaining function and as much function as we possibly can. And what I wanna end with is sort of what I began with. Um, you know, whenever someone has cancer involving their bone, um, it's very important to see an orthopedic oncologist because of uh, this is what we take care of. And a lot of these techniques are, are newer, not done by a regular orthopedic surgeon. And we just have a lot more options um, that can help give the person the best outcome possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zuckerman. It's just incredible um, to see the capabilities of surgery now. It was just fascinating to learn more. I did get a few questions that came in kind of a little bit more around diagnostics. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask those. And then if anybody else has questions, feel free to unmute yourself or type them in the chat. Um, but the first question I got was around the diagnosis of sarcomas. Um, is there blood work that can detect sarcoma or is it imaging tests only at this time? Yeah, so there's basically just imaging and biopsying. There's no test right now that shows it with, with blood work, unfortunately. So they're working on that, um, but no one's come up with something that can definitively diagnose um, sarcoma or look for if it's come back and things like that. But there are a lot of people testing that. And I think we're getting closer to that, but it still may be a little bit of time. Um, and then another question, I think um, Dr. Abelnick touched on this just a little bit, but particular risk factors for sarcoma. Yeah, so the average patient doesn't actually have a risk factor for sarcoma. It's really the very rare patient that will have a risk factor. And the main risk factor that we see is going to be someone who's exposed to prior radiation therapy. And so whether or not it be a breast cancer patient who's had radiation or someone who's had radiation for head and neck cancer, um, and that would be one risk factor. The other risk factor is going to be a familial risk factor that some people are born with a genetic condition that will predispose them to sarcomas. But that is very rare. For those of us who see high volume of sarcoma patients, we see very few patients with a genetic predisposition. So the average patient walking in develops their disease because no other reason than a cancer cell formed in their body and their body didn't correct it. Right. And I think, um, Dr. Zuckerman, this was to your point about seeing, you know, someone that specializes in sarcoma when pursuing surgery. Um, and this person said, is it common for sarcoma patients to come to you and your team with more advanced stages or recurrences because they were previously treated by a surgeon who didn't specialize in sarcoma? Yeah, you know, I'd like to say that I don't see anybody. Um, it varies. You know, one problem that we have is insurance. So it's sometimes difficult with certain HMOs and stuff like that um, with different regions that people come from because orthopedic oncology is so specialized, usually you have to end up at a major center. And sometimes insurance companies don't send you to that major center initially. Most times people see an orthopedic surgeon though the orthopedic surgeon knows to send you to an orthopedic oncologist because that's just ingrained in the training. That doesn't mean it still doesn't happen because sometimes because a regular orthopedic surgeon doesn't see sarcomas, they're rare, you know, they get a little fooled, you know, and what, what the problem actually was. And they may think it's one thing, um, but it ends up being something else. Um, so we do see some patients that are more advanced and it can be just a general delay in getting a diagnosis because they are so rare. And that can also be also, um, you know, pathologists. It, some pathologists don't uh, see sarcoma. So when someone gets a biopsy, it may get a delay in that diagnosis or very rarely it does happen that there's an improper diagnosis. Um, the good thing overall is that most orthopedic surgeons know to send someone out. So we don't see it that much, but we still see it every couple of months. Thank you. 
Any other remaining questions? You can feel free to type them in the chat or say them out loud. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Adelnick and Dr. Zuckerman. We really appreciated you sharing your knowledge today. Again, it was just so fascinating to see what is possible now and what's on the horizon. So I wanna thank you so much for your time today and thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you very much for having us. I appreciate it. Definitely, thank you for having us. Bye.